an jedem Tag nur zu denken an Deutschland, an Feind und an Reich, an unsere deutsche Nation und unser deutscher Feind. 1941, the world is on fire. In Europe, Hitler's Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe have crushed all resistance. First thing uh, that was implemented by Hitler after he had taken to power was a Ministry of Propaganda. And under this ministry, all of the information industry had been centralized within half a year. That is, there, were, there was only one radio channel that was completely controlled by the Nazis and all of the print industry, all newspapers, all magazines, were under control of a censor that sat in the Ministry of Propaganda. Uh, it was strictly forbidden by law uh, to listen to foreign radio stations, to, to radio stations outside Germany. Uh, so the first thing they tried was to limit the Germans' view on the outside world and make them think in the direction the Nazi party had decided. Only England still stands against the tyrant's plans for total conquest. Imperial Japanese forces have brutally overrun much of Southeast Asia and parts of China and threaten India, the Philippines, and even Australia. The United States has been supplying Britain with food, fuel, and weapons, but Americans are reluctant to fully enter the war until a surprise attack on the U.S. naval airbase at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by Imperial Japanese carrier planes, propels America into the storm. The United States is not well prepared for this fight, but it quickly gathers its might. And for the next three and a half years, its men and women, its industrial strength, and its fearsome, relentless resolve will beat back the forces of cruel tyranny and change the course of history. The men and women who fought that war under the U.S. flag have been called the greatest generation. Raised in the Great Depression, hoping for a better life, but taught to make do and to make the best of what they had, they went to war because it was their duty. Ordinary young men and women doing extraordinary things. In foxholes, tanks, ships, planes, bunkers, and field hospitals doing whatever it might take to win the war and come home again. Tens of thousands would find their final rest in foreign soil. And when it was over, those who did come home rekindled that fearsome resolve and helped to make America the strongest, wealthiest nation on earth. It's been 78 years since that terrible conflict came to an end. Most of the young men and women who fought in that war have passed on. Gone west, as aviators say, and more of them follow every day. It is up to each of us, their sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters, to help preserve their stories, to retell them, to pass them on to future generations. Uh, back in 1990, I had written some uh, little notes uh, concerning my thoughts about Colonel Doolittle. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, no, uh, yeah. Oh, you go. <laughs> 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 uh, actually, Colonel Doolittle was five foot six, but uh, the way I, I was able to put it together was. He was short in stature, but tall on accomplishment. A man of integrity, honor, and courage. He excluded confidence, determination, and strength. He was intelligent, educated, and humble. 
great respect for others, led by example and inspiration to all, and we would have followed him anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, as we bring out the greatest generation, uh, as you welcome them, I would like to tell you that this afternoon we will replay during the one o'clock uh, hour the presentation of a few years ago with David Hartman and General uh, McGee with the Tuskegee Airmen. That will be live streamed and it will also be playing here on the Jumbotron, a replay. And welcome, sir. Thank you for being here. I said the middle. What? Well, I, I can sit on there. Okay, there. No. turn you around. All right. Okay. Okay. Crowd's noisy. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, he brings his own chair. Yep. Just pull up, pull up a little bit. There we go. You got it. All right, we got it. All right. We appreciate your patience. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, the last Warbird in View for 2023. Um, I'll, I'll say now this is the, the last and the best with the, uh, the gentleman that we have here and also up on the big screen up there. Um, I'm Ed McElhinney. I'll be your moderator along with an assistant today, Larry Kelly, who also owns this beautiful B-25 right here. So, uh, Sarah, Larry and I are going to be doing kind of a tag team a little bit. We'll be asking some questions, but the, the, the bottom line is we would like these members of the greatest generation to do most of the talking. Um, I will introduce them by age. And the first, and if, if you all were here last year, you might recognize the guy on the screen over there. His name is John Lucky Luckadoo. Um, 101 years old. Is that right now? I, I, think, I, I think we're up to 101. So that's, that's Lucky. He was a member of the Bloody 100th, and he'll tell you stories about that, but he was a B-17 pilot, um, and he successfully made 25 missions in World War II and survived to be here. Number two, um, in terms of uh, chronology, I think we've got our last man down here. Uh, Mr. Ver Verbanek, he's a lieutenant uh, when he fought. I think he's 90, 99 years 99. old. So Carl Verbanek is 99 years old. <laughs> and the youngster of our group is Bob Holmstrom here, uh, staff sergeant when he flew. And I think, Bob, you're what, 97? 97. Okay, so he's only 97 years old. Thank you. The program that we've got today, we've got these three great individuals, and, and, and each one has got their own stories. So we're going to kind of separate it. Um, each one will have his own time. At the very end, we'll, we'll get Larry to talk a little bit about the airplane, and then we'll open it up to questions. So, um, so with that, we're going to start with Lieutenant Carl Verbanek at the end. And by the way, Brittany's is granddaughter and she's going to be assisting today um, <laughs> and um, and and we'll we'll first begin by just telling you a little bit about how he was trained he was a b-26 bombardier navigator is what right. he, he was by training um, but that's not how it ended up and uh, uh, Carl you want to start uh, just by telling us a little bit about um, how, how you got into that b-26 and then what you ended up flying after that uh, 
transition training B twenty twenty sixes. Our crew, uh, we were on our way to pick up our new airplanes in Florida. We had been training in Barksdale Field in Louisiana. Uh, we loved our airplanes. We thought that the 26 was the greatest thing there was. And uh, anyways, on a train trip to Florida, somebody come up down the aisle and looking for me as and another navigator. We were yanked off the train, put on another train to go to West Virginia. Our crew went down to Florida, got their airplanes. I was replaced by an ATC navigator. They uh, one step above what I was. They were trained with the celestial navigation, which is uh, a little something you might need when you're crossing the ocean and you have no landmarks to know where the hell you are. You got to work off the sun and uh, that gives you uh, your, your, your directions and you know, where to go. So they were Anyway, if we, I would set uh, to West Virginia to pick up uh, a ride on a Liberty ship. There's something else. 30 days on the ocean to, to get to Africa. My crew had gone down Florida, down to Brazil, across the ocean, landed in Africa, and I was bobbing around the waves but uh, the trip they took along, when they left Africa, headed north, someplace alongside of Portugal, a mid-air collision, collision, and my crew was gone. And the poor navigator that took my place, he was gone too. But I didn't know this until uh, we landed in Africa at Oran. Now this place, this camp, you wouldn't believe, but it, it was a war camp. Everything is like you'd see in World War I trenches. Trenches six foot deep, you couldn't see over the top. And little rooms were carved out of the ground. And uh, probably four or five double-decker cots, and uh, I don't know how many places like this were carved out, but we waited for a ship, a beautiful British liner, picked us up, took us to Naples. This is my first sight of what war was. 
farmed out everything you wouldn't believe. People all over dying, no place to go. Anyways, uh, we were shipped up to a place, uh, a replacement depot. Uh, I didn't, this is when I found out my crew was gone and we sat around Naples for about a month. I finally got it signed to a B-26 outfit. Ooh. When I got there, it had all been converted to B-25s. This is what I flew my missions in. I didn't get to fly many, but I had one mission that I'd like to tell you about. It was in about the middle of December, uh, 1944. We uh, flew out of Corsica Sarajaya was the name of, of our air base and um, we flew all the way across the north, north central part of Italy and we come out on the Adriatic side, above Venice. And before you got that far, you could see in the sky airplanes. Airplanes and airplanes. I didn't know it until we read about it in the uh, little newspaper, I forgot the name of it, but anyways, it was a thousand airplane raid. B-17s, B-24s, B-25s, P-51s, the red tails. You could see these airplanes maybe 10 miles away, they were streaming up along the Adriatic, uh, heading for the Palesti air oil fields. And uh, we knew that was a pretty tough place to go. Not knowing that the place that uh, we were going, we would join the group until we got to the northern edge of Italy. And then we cut it back west to, to a place called the Brenner Pass. The railroad yards, the, the Brenner Pass, was a one of the very few places or routes that the Germans could use for supplies to take care of their forces in Italy. Uh, the railroad yards or marshalling yards, uh, they would put together trains, move them out at, at night. They couldn't do much traveling in a day because uh, our, our planes were always looking for them. Yeah. And uh, what we were doing on this mission 
was to palm up to the yards. Uh, it uh, was fantastic. The Germans had us nailed flat like you would see over Germany would on front of us just strings of flat straight ahead. We were bouncing around. Of course, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, but anyways, on the way back, we cut through Italy and back out over the Mediterranean to Corsica. On the way uh, along the Corsican coast, uh, two planes had to go down. They shot up too bad. And we were on the tail end of uh, our group. The pilot asked uh, if we could break out of our formation and, and watch these guys. And we threw out a life raft. We could see them, the parachutes. They the planes were floating, but some of the crew had dropped out with parachutes. We watched those chutes one after another disappear, and the guys were gone. We made it back to our air base, got out of our airplane, and the crew was running around it like mad. They counted 27 holes in it. And uh, my pilot thought, well, well, he told me it was rougher than you think. And uh, the, that, uh, that raid was about the highlight of my flying career in Italy. Most of the other places were railroad bridges, bridges, warehouses, and things like that. Uh, we never encountered that. Uh, the problems of flying in real terrible uh, flat German. They really had guns that uh, really get to you. And Thank they you. knew how to do it. Thank you. That, that Thank what you. can I say? That, that, yeah. You survived. You were just You survived. Great. And, and, and we, we thank you for the mission. I, I have to point out something special on his left wrist right now, though. And uh, his compliments of Larry. It's, not, it, it, it's something that's just temporary, but we were inside. And uh, I, you saw the film. Uh, Carl flew the B-25, you know, and you heard that he trained in a B-26. Then he gets over there. His crew is gone. He ends up in a B-25 that he never even trained in. Yes. Um, but, but in that, that film, you saw Jimmy Doolittle, the raid on Japan. And uh, Larry was wearing this watch. And, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you tell the story. He well, said, no, I don't need to wear this watch. He said, this gentleman needs to wear the watch. So, Larry, go ahead. <laughs> well, back in 1992, Jimmy Doolittle... Uh, when he had a meeting with uh, uh, Don Penny Snyder, who had been assisting him, Gerald Ford had introduced him, and Gerald Ford uh, uh, 
was a good friend of uh, Don Penny Schneider, worked for Drew Ford as director of communications in the, in the uh, White House. And uh, there was this big reception, and General Doolittle was there. And Gerald Ford asked Don, could he help the general uh, with some speech writing? The two of them wound up being great friends. They found out they lived only three blocks from each other. And uh, for years, uh, their friendship was very, very close. In 1992, one day in the office when uh, the Snyders were there helping the, the general with some uh, correspondence, uh, Doolittle opened his drawer and took this wristwatch out of the drawer and handed it to Don and said, here, you take this. He said, the Air and Space Museum wants this, but I don't want to have them. They'll put it in a box and file it away and nobody will ever see it again. So you keep this and keep the story of my boys going. Don asked him, he said, is this the watch you wore on the raid? It's a Charles Lindbergh invented Longines Hour Angle watch. It was given to Doolittle in 1939. And he said, yes. And uh, so it's been a prized possession of Don until last November when he passed it to me to be the next caretaker. You don't own something like Jimmy Doolittle's wristwatch. You become a caretaker. My charge is to find the next caretaker and to continue to keep the memory alive. And I bring it to events like this to share with other pilots. But sitting in here and finding out that he flew B-25s in combat, I said, it's appropriate for you to wear this today, not me. So that's the wristwatch that he's wearing today. It was Jimmy Doolittle's wristwatch. And ironically, when he was with 12th Air Force, Jimmy Doolittle was his commander. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. And yeah, Carl, I think you're going to have to give it back. That's all I can well, say. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little later. <laughs> all right. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, our, our guest that is uh, joining us via Zoom. And there he is. And there's Lucky. Um, I'll preface this with his book. It's called Damn Lucky, Outstanding Read. I, wrote it I, I read it last year. Great stories. And, uh, and Lucky, I'll just say thank you so much for being here. I, I, I told him earlier, it doesn't look like he's aged another year at all. He looks great. Um, and uh, again, he's, uh, uh, truly speaking, I wish we could have an entire program for each one of these individuals. Unfortunately, we can't. But Lucky, I'm going to just ask you, what you, what you want to bring out here? He was a member, as I said, of the Bloody 100th. Um, that was the, uh, the bomb group that uh, if you were sitting there in a briefing and you had four guys sitting there, hey, one of those guys was going to come home. The other three were either going to be missing in action, prisoners of war, or, uh, or passed away. So, uh, Lucky, I'll open it up to you. And, and where do you want to go with this? What, what would you like to bring out to this crowd right now? Well, I'd like to thank you first for uh, having me, uh, even though this is somewhat remote. Uh, it is a pleasure to join you, uh, even on Zoom, and um, <clears throat> share some of my experiences of uh, 80 years. Uh-oh, technical difficulties. I... Flexibility is the key to air power. Let's see if we can get this resolved at it's this point. Over there he to is. celebrate the uh, anniversary, the 80th anniversary of my very worst mission, which was the beginning of what became known as Black Week uh, during 1943, when. <clears throat> The 8th Air Force pulled out all of the stops, and we put up a maximum effort in an attempt to uh, bring the Nazi war machine to its knees. We suffered horrendous losses, and uh, as a consequence of that, but one of the things that uh, I'd like to point out to you is that both the Japanese in the Pacific and Hitler in the European war grossly underestimated the ability of the United States to outproduce the world. This is what spelled our victory. 
Hitler did not believe, nor did Hirohito believe, that we could replace our losses, that they could inflict such serious damage to our forces that we would never be able to recover. We not only recovered, but we outproduced anything the world had ever seen before or since or will ever see again. And this is how we prevailed and how we won World War II is that we were able to train our troops, our crews, our air crews. We were able to produce with impunity because we were protected by the Atlantic Ocean on the east and by the Pacific on the west. And we were not harassed day and night by bombing as both the Japanese and the, uh, the Germans were. I would like to point out that myself, as well as my comrades, were citizen soldiers. We were going up against a formidable enemy certainly in Europe, that was so far experienced, better experienced and better equipped than we were. And they'd been fighting for four years. So they knew what they were doing and they had perfected their techniques and they were extremely effective. And we were going up against the pros. We were playing in the back, their backyard Britain or all of Europe was completely occupied by the Nazis when we got to Europe in the summer of 1943 and began confronting them and trying to bring them uh, to their knees, which we eventually did, as you know. But why the group that I was assigned to became known as the Bloody Hundreds is due to a number of reasons, not the least of which was that when we lost crews, we lost big. In the raid that I mentioned that was my worst, was my 22nd to Bremen on October the 8th of 1943, we sent out 18 airplanes from the 100th bomb group. We lost 12 out of that 18 on the bomb run. Between the initial point and releasing our bombs, I brought what was left of the group, which was a mere six airplanes, home by rallying them and back into formation and attaching on to the following wave of the 95th bomb group that particular day on that particular mission, they had lost a complete squadron. And so we filled in for their losses. And that was the one mission that I really seriously doubted. I was going to survive. Lucky, I'm now I... 101 years old, and thank God for every day that I have survived. I'm not a hero. I am a survivor. I happen to be the last remaining original 100th bomb group pilot still standing. And so I am frequently asked to speak about my experiences to school children, to third generations, and to make them aware of the tremendous sacrifices that were made by my generation or they wouldn't be here. None of us would be here. So that is my contribution to serving my country in time of war, which 
was necessary. We had no choice. And unknown to all of you, because you weren't here at the time, all of America was united behind the war effort. Unlike anything that we've ever seen before or since. And unfortunately today, the oath that we took when we accepted service and were enlisted was to protect our values against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And today, we are being betrayed from within. So it's necessary for current generations to be made aware of the sacrifices that are required to protect our freedoms and be thankful that we're able to do so. And it is my sincere hope that current generations will pick up the cudgel and insist that our values be honored and that we wave the flag with pride. God bless America. Thank you so much, Lucky, for those words. And, and I'll just say, some folks might not understand those losses. You talked of airplane losses. Um, Tell them what you lost with one airplane, how many crew members there were. In the B-17, we had a crew of 10. And as a 21-year-old, believe you me, I went overseas as a co-pilot and was therefore the second in command of my crew. They took 40 of us from my flying school class, newly minted pilots directly from flying school and stuck us into the right seat of a B-17. We had never been in a B-17 before. <laughs> and this was just before going to war. We did not have the benefit of pre-combat training that the rest of the crew did, but we were suddenly placed in this position of responsibility for not only our own skin, but nine other crew members. Mm -hmm. So believe you me, even though we were hairy-headed college kids, we grew up in a hurry. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Lucky, I'm going to ask if you can, you can hang with us for another 20 minutes here or so. There's going to be some questions for you, I'm sure. But I want to get to uh, another one of our honored generation kind of guys here, and, and, uh, and that is Bob Holmstrom. Um, he didn't write this book. The name of the book is Warbirds in the Cloak of Darkness. He was sworn to secrecy for 40 years and couldn't say anything about what he really did. His official position was tail gunner in a B-24, staff sergeant. What did he end up flying? Well, he went to Europe, went to England, black airplanes. You probably never even knew he had black air. I mean, literally, they painted these airplanes black. Um, they modified them somewhat, and then sent them on these missions. Um, the mission code name was Carpetbagger. And you'll see he's got some patches there that talks about the Carpetbaggers. And he's going to describe some of those missions. Uh, but basically, it was a B-24 that flew low altitude at night, alone, armed. But as he said, I don't think they ever fired a shot in anger. 
He got shot at a lot. But what his mission was, was to supply the underground and the folks behind the lines with guns, equipment, pigeons, people. They did all those things. So I'm going to let Bob talk a little bit about that mission and uh, the, the highs and lows of it. Um, so Bob, tell us about being a carpetbagger. Well, being a carpetbagger was an opportunity to really help our country. We trained to learn different languages because we were flying from England over to Denmark, Germany, France, Belgium, up to Norway. And I flew as far over as Russia and Switzerland on some of our long trips. And on those trips, we flew several dog legs all alone at night when the moon was out only. Only when the moon was out. We had to see the ground where we were going for navigation. And we would fly several dog legs to mislead the Germans, uh, maybe five or six dog legs, so the Germans wouldn't know our target that we were going to to supply the underground. When we got our plane loaded in England, it was loaded with containers that if you can see my arms about this big around, and the containers were made out of real heavy cardboard, and they had a about seven feet long, and they had a bumper on the bottom, a cushion, so that when the container hit the bottom, it wouldn't destroy the material that we were serving to the Patriots. And it had a white parachute on it. The material that we dropped supported many, many groups of underground. Some of the underground groups were 25, 30 people. Some were 200. Now those people never lived in the town. They lived in the mountains, in the woods, any place they could hide so that they could harass the Germans. In those containers were dynamite. Uh, so they could blow up telephone poles, railroad tracks, bridges, stuff like that. They would sneak out of the woods and do that. There was medicine in some of them, radios, so they could contact Europe. They also had machine guns and hand grenades, clothes that people needed, anything to survive just like you would today and tomorrow. But wait, I got to stop you. You talked about radios, but weren't there some pigeons in there too? Well, what were they doing? That was a different flight, but uh, one trip was over by the Danube River, and my pilot would fly his route following the river. But the pigeons were in a carton like a Quaker Oats oatmeal box. Had three days of food for the pigeons. It had a pencil in there and capsules so the patriots, when they got the pigeons, would write down their message, their orders, groceries, medicine, or whatever they needed, and the, release the pigeon, and the pigeon would fly back to England. It, sometimes it was a couple days, maybe three, and that pigeon, carrier pigeon, would always make it back again. In that, when we threw the, when I would safety strap myself on the side of the ship, and open up the trap door, I would 
my waste gunner would hand me each box and I was told by the navigator when to throw it out. I would lean out and actually be out below the airplane bottom. And that box with pigeons in it would explode at a hundred feet with a barometric fuse with a small parachute so the pigeon would land safely. And many times we'd be banked 90 degrees and we were that low going on down the river and I would look up to the side and two or three hundred feet higher was a German castle. Now that was kind of scary but it had to be done and we helped so many people in that way. It was all humanitarian. I was so happy about that when the war was over that we really helped people, never killed anybody. But you also lost some airplanes, didn't you? <laughs> Not all your, your, your carpet baggers, baggers made it back, did they? No, not all of them made it back. When we lost an airplane, we lost 10 people, of course. And when we made a trip, uh, there was no radio communication. When we took off from our runway, we were all alone, like I say, in the dark with the moon shining. There was no communication, no fighter planes. No one knew where we were going except my navigator and my pilot. I wasn't privileged to know until we got about halfway to our target. Then I could find out what happened. The longest trips that we made were something like 10 hours. Now, in the winter of 44 and 45, that was the coldest winter there ever was in Europe in a hundred years. So sometimes it was 40 below zero when we were flying. But we had electric suits, boots, clothes. So it was pretty good as long as those, those suits could be heated. <laughs> Some of them went out and it, and it was just survival, I'll tell you. It was pretty cold. The oxygen mask would freeze to our face and we would look like chimpanzees with the thing on there. It was something different. The Another thing, we... Another thing that we were flying at night the Germans really didn't pay too much attention to a single plane flying overhead. Sometimes an ME-1209 would come up and fly maybe three, four hundred yards to our right or left or, and wiggle his wings and turn and fly away. Wouldn't even shoot. The next time you better look out because the next guy is going to be shooting. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just that way, all the Germans weren't bad. Germans were good, some of them. On some of our flights, we just dropped leaflets in containers. And at that time, we would fly only about 18 to 20,000 feet high. And those containers contained uh, messages for the underground. It called some were false informations for the Germans, so we could maybe send them the right, wrong way and tell them different things and tell the German people actually what was happening in the war because Germany censored their people so well that they couldn't get any messages from the outside. So, and we heard about those leaflets later after the war, and it was really something. That leaflets were dropped from those, like I say, 20,000 feet. At 10,000 feet, a barometric fuse would blow that capsule all to pieces, and those leaflets would spread out, 
and cover a 30 square mile area. So the Germans couldn't run around and pick them up and burn them and destroy them before the population seen them. How about, you know, the, your, your missions where you were dropping supplies or weapons, how was, and it was at night, obviously, how, how was it marked? Were there, uh, there were obviously probably not lights, but maybe fires, or, or yeah. what did they use to, uh, to you know, you, you got yourself in the area, but good navigation, obviously, but then, hey, what were you looking for? When we, when we were supplying the underground with those supplies, we looked and we had a time frame within about five minutes at a spot where we were going to drop. The Patriots knew we were coming. They built three fires in a row and one off to the side or else they used flashlights and did the same. We made the drop on the side where the single light was. We would pass over at 500 feet, 450, whatever so, we could get down and we'd have to slow up to below 120 miles an hour next to stalling speed. So when the capsules were dropped, they wouldn't rip the chutes. So, and so all their stuff would be safe. Okay. And then, then we'd turn around and make a make circle it. and fly back to Germany and look for those white cliffs of Dover when we come back. All right, I'm going uh, to stop for now and turn it over to Larry and just get him to talk a little bit about this beautiful airplane that we've got here. He's owned it for quite some time. He's got thousands of hours in it. Um, so, Larry, give us a clue about uh, this beautiful B-25 that we're using the shade for right now. Well, let me tell you a little bit first about the, the original Panchito served with the 396 Bomb Squadron, 41st Bomb Group, 7th Air Force in the Pacific. And uh, you see the name Don Seiler under the window on the left. And a special story is about why that's painted on there, but... Uh, when this particular airframe was built in late 1944, uh, it was too late in the war. It never was assigned to a uh, to a unit used for a transition, and then it wound up uh, it wound up going to uh, uh, storage, and then it was sold in 1960 uh, and turned into a fire bomber. Uh, we have some uh, uh, come by and assist a little later on. We'll show you some uh, photo books of the restoration of the airplane. It was used as a fire bomber, and then later it went down to Florida where it was used, uh, the Howell brothers mounted a Volkswagen motor back in the waste gun area, powering a pump. They mounted spray bars under the hard points under the wings, and they sprayed orange groves and mosquitoes. And, of course, the DDT they were using spray back then just corroded the airplane. It was uh, abandoned. Uh, it was donated to and basically abandoned outdoors at the SST Museum in St. Cloud, Florida. Uh, in 1981, the museum went defunct, and the airplanes were all sold. Uh, all the assets were sold. Tom Riley got the airplane, took the wings off, towed it to his restoration shop, and over the next six years, he and his crew worked professionally to restore the airplane, and the three gentlemen that owned the airplane and was paying for the restoration, their pastor at their church back in Texas was a gentleman named Bob Miller. Bob Miller and his identical twin brother, Bill, were the two turret gunners on Panchito, the original Panchito, serving in the, uh, in the Pacific. Now, Don Saylor, I mentioned his name. Don uh, had volunteered, was trained as a pilot, first pilot, meaning the command pilot. Uh, served his first combat tour with the 41st down in the Solomon Islands. And by late 1944, the Japanese you know, uh, problem in the Solomons was pretty much taken care of. 41st Bomb Group was brought back to Hawaii to get outfitted with new aircraft. They got new. Jet, they flew G models with a cannon in the nose of them, a 75 millimeter cannon, a Sherman tank gun, is what they flew uh, in down in the Solomon Islands. But now they got these brand new, beautiful J model airplanes. And yes, they were not painted. Well, why did you stop painting airplanes? It slows down production by a week. It adds 600 pounds to an airplane, so that's one less bomb you can carry and a lot less fuel you can carry. Why did you need paint? So the way the airplanes looked with this beautiful 
bare metal B-25. So he and his buddy Ben Tarnaskas, who had trained together, they went to see, to the base theater, they went to see the Three Caballeros. You may have seen it. It's a Disney animated music, uh, animated cartoon of, uh, movie from late 1944. Well, they knew then what they were going to paint on their airplane. Bob could see himself, you know, uh, or Don, as the as Mexican rooster shooting off the two six guns. And Ben Tarnaska, the romantic, he could see himself as, uh, uh, as Carioca Joe, the green parrot from Brazil. He painted that on his airplane. And off they went to, the, to uh, the, uh, Okinawa. And when they arrived on Okinawa, Don Seiler was the senior combat pilot in the 396 bomb squadron, the old man. He was the most experienced, the one the new pilots had to fly with before they could fly with their own crews in combat. He was 22 years old. How many of you out there are 22 years old? <laughs> okay, I see a couple of hands go up. Yeah. Imagine being the old man, the most experienced guy, and being responsible for the lives of so many young men. But I had the great honor. At Mid-Atlantic Air Museum, one year, a number of years ago, we met Bill Miller. He comes walking up, shows me a picture, and it sort of caught me, it caught my breath. So I said, now I've got a connection to the original, pilot, original crew of the original airplane. And uh, a couple of months later, I met uh, Don Seiler's kid brother at the uh, Akron Air Show. And now I had a connection to the officers. And I found out that Don's, Don had died in the early 1980s from a brain tumor. He had two young boys. These two young boys never really knew their dad. But I found out that both had grown up to be aeronautical engineers. And Don's wife was still alive and doing very well. They had never met any of the enlisted that had flown with Don in Okinawa or even in the, in the Solomons. Don had kept a very detailed diary, excuse me, Bill had, Bill Miller had, and in that diary was entry after entry after entry about what a wonderful man Don Seiler was. No one ever had a spark plug foul on them when they were flying with Don Seiler. He was the one that they all wanted to lead the missions. So here was these two young guys, that young men, had grown up, never really knew their dad. So we invited Ruth and the boys to join us at the Cleveland Air Show the follow in, in the fall. And Bill Miller came along with his diary. And this is what Warbirds is about. They're sitting on the tailgate of a pickup truck, parked on the airplane the day before the air show started. These two boys, who are now grown men with their own family, and Ruth, remembering her husband, they sat and learned firsthand, not from some historian who had rewrote history from what he thought may be accurate, but from the man who actually flew combat with their dad, their husband, you know, in Europe. That's what Warbirds of America does, is keep that connection, that, that history alive to the greatest generation. These gentlemen here, you know, when, and, and, and when I had the honor of, of getting General Doolittle's wristwatch, you know, to be the caretaker of that icon, we're sitting in here, I said, this is not appropriate for me to wear out here today. That's why this gentleman was, because he flew under the command of General Doolittle during the war. Uh, but the B-25, uh, just shy of 10,000 of them were built, a uh, medium bomber. Uh, early in the war, they were taking tremendous losses in the Pacific. Now, the B-25 was used in every theater of the war by all the Allied Air Forces. Uh, they took they were used as a medium bomber, but it really gained his fame, not only on the Doolittle Tokyo Raid, where 16 were used. Have you ever heard the story of say, well, it was, a, it was a suicide mission? You ask any one of the Doolittle Raiders was a suicide mission, they didn't think so. That was not what they were trained for. They were trained for the mission to land, go to Chuchao, China, land, refuel, fly on to Chongqing, and the aircraft were going to be donated or given to the Nationalist Chinese and, and, and Claire Chenault, the Flying Tigers, and this is going to make up the bomber command. The B-25s and the Dula Raid were going to make up a bomber command for uh, 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 the Flying Tigers. But early in, in mid part of the war, when we were getting such heavy losses, if they were bombing a ship, they'd be at 10,000 feet. They'd drop the bombs. The Japanese commander could look up and say, oh, okay, well, let's just turn right, and the bombs would miss. They were getting shot down and taking heavy losses, but... Uh, 
Pappy Gunn, salty uh, sort of feller, and uh, Jack Cox from North American Aviation decided they were starting to modify them. They needed something to do low-level attack. They started adding, adding more and more machine guns. By the time the J models were built, you notice there's a seam right here where you can take one nose off and put another one on. On the J models, you could have as many as eight 50 caliber machine guns in the nose, two in each one of the package guns, two in the top. Count them up. That's 14 forward firing 50 caliber machine guns. And by the way, you put four of them wing abreast. Count them up. That's 56 50 caliber machine guns. Line them up, coming over a Japanese airfield, 330 miles an hour, as they say, balls to the wall, wide open, throttles to the, all the way up. Treetop level, the Japanese turn their machine guns up. It's like trying to run under a waterfall without getting wet. They were getting hit. They were getting shot up. The 345th at one time, the Air Apaches were taking as, as heavy losses as 20% losses a day. But yet going back into combat the next day after sleeping all night uh, in the swamp, getting eaten up by mosquitoes, eating rancid food, getting up, going again, the mechanics working all night. There was a mechanic for the 345th one time. He told me, he said, you know, without us, them pilots, they just another mouth to feed. <laughs> <laughs> These guys work all night long to keep the airplanes flying. But imagine the firepower then. So the B-25 really gained its fame later in the war when they were used close air support, ground attack, uh, uh, very, very effective then in the, in the role as a strafer. There was one young man one time, he, uh, with, uh, again, another 345th bomb group story, and then I'll, I'll give it back to you, Ed. But it's an interesting story. They came back from a mission. The left engine was feathered. Cowling was all busted up. It landed, and you can't taxi a B-25 without both engines running because the nose wheels are free castering nose wheel. I see Nadav here. He learned that when he went through our fly school. Kara and Sabrina over here, they learned that when they learned to fly with us. So all he could do was land and roll off the end. Well, this is supposed to be a milk run. They had, they had shot this airfield up day after day after day. So the CO comes running down a Jeep, gets out of the Jeep, do this boastful says, what the hell happened to you? Big, tall Texan, he said, well, sir, we hit a bird. <laughs> he said, how the hell could a bird do that much damage to an airplane? He was sitting in a tree. <laughs> That's a true story. The first time I heard that, I thought that had to be made up, but I heard that story later on from someone else. I love true it. True story. But it defines what the role was of the B-25 later in the war. Well, I just got to ask Bob here. Uh, you were talking about the number of guns that were on your airplane. Well, you had a crew of 10 on the B-24, and how yes. many 50 calibers you have on that thing? We had 20 50 caliber machine guns on so that. That's not bad, you know, no. 20, 20 50 cals on that thing. That's, and that was a standard airplane, correct? Right. All right. All right, I'm going to uh, open it up to questions right now. I know we're over. I think I've got, I haven't seen my sign yet that says uh, stop. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. And uh, questions for anybody in the audience here. Who we got? Can I ask a question? Of Young lady over here. Hi, I just wanted to ask Lucky a question. Well, first I wanted to thank him for his service and for sharing his truth with us who need to hear it right now. So thank him for that. But I was wondering if Lucky flew in the 463rd with Raymond Swanson. He was my uncle. Raymond Swanson, the 463rd. Did you fly with the 463rd at all, Lucky? No, we did not uh, fly in the same formation with the 463rd. Uh, we were in the 3rd uh, Air Division, and the 463rd, well, I believe, was in the 2nd. Uh, I'm sorry, the 1st Division. Uh, we were in the 3rd Division of of, um, uh, of the 8th Air Force. So uh, we may have been in the same formation, but... Um, uh, we, we did not fly that closely together. Okay, well, thank you again for your service and everything you've done to preserve our freedoms. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All right, other, here we go, Fly Navy. Just a simple question. Um, with that many 50 caliber guns, how much ammo could you carry? Okay, first, oh. is, that, is that to Larry on the B-25 or is that for? Uh, just whoever wants to answer. 
Yeah. How many bullets you guys carry? Um, you know, if, if that airplane had that many guns, what, what was the standard load? Any idea? Have you ever heard the phrase, give them the whole nine yards, 27 feet of 50 caliber ammo? I'm not sure what the, the, the total count was. So that was each gun had 27 feet probably. Well, and, and some more. You know, in, in the nose guns, the ammo box was a little smaller. But in the waist guns, there were two ammo boxes linked together. So, and the ammo boxes for the tail gunners were mounted all the way up at the waist gun went and shoots went all the way back to the tail. But because of weight and balance, you couldn't have that much weight back in the back. I'm sorry I don't know exactly the, the, the number of rounds. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, before we go any further, I, I just want to ask, and I do this every one of my presentations, veterans in the crowd, please stand. We want to say thank you to the, the current active duty and any other veterans. <laughs> thank you for what you're doing and what you did. All right, other question. We got one down here. I uh, recently heard from someone who had the unfortunate condition of being British that the Lancaster was better than the B-17, and he said that was because the... He said that... Oh, we're going again. Folks, that's the sound of freedom. Okay, so what plane get was in there that? Quick. He said that uh, something like the Lancaster would have been superior to the B-17, B-24 because the defensive armament weighed it down too much and made it too susceptible to the enemy. And I wanted to hear somebody who was actually there weigh in on that. I think it'd be our guy up here. I mean, he's the B-17 guy. So, uh, so Lucky, what do you think compared to the Brits, uh, the Lancaster versus the B-17? What do you think of the Lancaster? Well, we call them kites. Uh, <laughs> they, they were um, <laughs> uh, wooden frame and uh, fabric, whereas we were uh, built out of uh, aluminum alloy. So, um, and we flew at a much higher altitude in much colder weather. What I did not mention to you was the bitter cold that we had to endure in trying to prove that the high altitude, so-called strategic bombing that the 8th Air Force was uh, supposed to be doing was almost insufferable. It was 50 to 60 degrees below zero, and we were unpressurized just as the Lancaster was. But the Lancaster flew at night, didn't fly in the daytime, it flew uh, at much lower altitude, so it was warmer. They flew from 12 to 15,000, and they did not fly formation. Uh, so they were utilized in a far different fashion uh, than the, uh, the B-17 and the B-24 uh, in the 8th Air Force. All right, thank you. Answer your question? Okay. I just got a comment. My uncle was a navigator in the B-24s in the 5th, and he said he never met a B-25 crew that wasn't completely nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of that's probably because the airplane is so loud. Uh, it's the loudest cockpit of World War II, and it'll take your hearing. It'll drive you nuts. Now, I've lost a lot of hearing in my left ear from flying this airplane. Uh, wow is right. All right, any other questions up there for these gentlemen? No. All right, I guess we're going to wrap it up then and, uh, and say, oh, yes, the books are here. Um, and I'm not sure, somebody help me, uh, they're going to be back in the merchandise and, and uh, there's going to be some signing done by Bob, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yep, he's going to be signing his book. And, and again, I read his book, oh, probably... Uh, three or four months ago when I found out I was going to be out here, Warbirds in the Cloak of Darkness. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it goes into great detail of the, uh, the Carpetbagger mission. Um, very interesting. Uh, and, again, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't say anything about it for 40 years. They were sworn to secrecy. So, uh, so yep, they'll be there. Uh, Lucky's book is back there, too, by the way. Uh, Born Lucky. Um, and as you heard from him, uh, a, a, a fine gentleman and a fine book also. 
And uh, oh, Kyle's got something to say here, too. For those that buy the book, we've got some very special cards that Lucky signed for us before. And they're all they're available in the book. Oh, outstanding. So you'll get Lucky's signature there also. So uh, with that, yeah, I'm going to say that uh, Larry's probably going to be down here. If you uh, got questions and you want to walk around the airplane, take a look at it. Larry's the expert. He'll tell you everything he knows about this thing, which is considerable. And, uh, and in the meantime, I say thank you for being here. I, I truly appreciate your presence. And more importantly, I say thank you to these gentlemen and, and what they did, when they did it, how they did it. And I thank you for our freedom. Bob, thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. North American Trainer Association, or NATA, is known for bringing warbirds together in a stunning showcase that celebrates human ingenuity and opens the world of military aircraft to future generations. It's the future generations that hold the power of these great birds in their hands, much like NATA member Garrett Fleischman. You're not just flying in the moment. You're flying with a whole bunch of history on your shoulders, and it really means a lot to fly them. Bridging history and the future, NATA supports those who remember when and future generations through clinics, scholarships, social media, and a world-class magazine. NATA is a resource for the entire Warbird community and it's open to anyone. Membership can get you access to history in a way you've never experienced before, on the ground and in the air. Without NATA's help through scholarships and regional clinics, the best and the brightest of aviation's future wouldn't have the opportunities they need to soar. I myself do not own a T-6, I do not have the resources to fly in big formation flights on my own, but joining an organization like NADA allows me to do this just because I'm motivated and eager to learn. The scholarships for future Warbird a and mechanics is a start, but it's the clinics that keep everyone up to date and provide the necessary training and type club support. And to keep the momentum going, there will be even more regional clinics and events in the future. These regional clinics offer an opportunity like no other to learn about flying warbirds in formation and to become a better pilot. We all share the same interest of being a better pilot, being a safer pilot, being a uh, better formation pilot. join this organization and it's a constant learning process and and that's another thing that I love about it because a good pilot is always learning always NETA membership isn't just for pilots 
It's for everyone who loves aviation, past, present, and future. We have a lot of members that are not, uh, they're not even pilots. They love the fact that uh, the, uh, the airplanes still fly and they share the enthusiasm and the pride that's going on. It's a place where history comes to life, where the future is sparked by imagination, and where aviation is more than just wings in the air. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. What else is it for? I was asked, you know, uh, where do I see NADA going into the future? And uh, I see uh, nowhere but up. Be a part of it. Join NADA today. I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Top Gun was really a thrill. I must have done well in actual combat because at the time I was just a lieutenant junior grade, which is a, a first lieutenant in the Air Force. And so I may have been the very first lieutenant junior grade to go through Top Gun. was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. STS-27 was my, was my third launch and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there and we brought up the television image of the right wing and I looked at what I was seeing and I said to myself, we are gonna die. To be an airline pilot, there was mandatory age 60 retirement. I was a NASA astronaut until I was 50 years old. And so I looked at the situation and I had known a number of Southwest airline pilots. And they were just like me. They were flying because they loved to fly. There's a lot of piloting that goes into it, a tremendous amount of piloting that goes into it because you're going to wind up passing other airplanes. You're, you're going to get in a duel with another airplane that's fairly closely matched. So there's a ton of satisfaction from, from doing that. And hey, let's just talk about the racing itself. It's fun to fly low but it's dangerous. <laughs> 